front of the high court. And speaking of challenges, is Connecticut ready when a COVID-19 vaccine gets federal approval? We learned this week that trials for the Pfizer vaccine candidate went surprisingly well and distribution could be here sooner than expected. I spoke with Keith Grant. He's the senior system director for infection prevention at Hartford HealthCare. He is also on Governor Lamont's vaccine advisory committee. That's the group charged with coming up with a distribution plan. So this week we learned that we could be weeks away from Pfizer requesting an emergency youth authorization for its COVID-19 vaccine. Does that change the work the committee is doing right now? No, absolutely not. So the responsibility of the committee is to respond to and to use the information that companies such as Pfizer bring out in order to advise the governor what the next best step is. So Pfizer comes out and saying, we're, um, we're one step closer. The committee knows we're one step closer as well. We're also um, aware of the fact that now there is more data for us to review from the scientific perspective. And there's more data, and it seemed to be very good data, 90% efficacy, that's, that's, you know, that's very impressive. So we know there's impressive data coming out for us to review and communicate with not just the governor, but formulate a plan how to communicate that with um, everyone within Connecticut um, to ensure that the vaccine is um, is acceptable. If and more data comes out and more cases are analyzed, doesn't oftentimes the efficacy go down the percentage? Not necessarily, but that's a very, very good question. So I think what, you, what you're asking is if you expand the N, so you expand your cohort or your sample size, um, would you have a bigger probability or higher probability to actually have, um, you know, lower efficacy. It's possible. Um, so what, what what we have right now is over 40,000, 40, a sample size of over 40,000 with an efficacy of 90%. Um, if you expand it, you might lose plus, plus minus 5%, might. Um, but at the same time, if you look at influenza vaccine, efficacy generally is about 40 to 45%. Um, we've advocated for the clinical community, science community, and in general, We've advocated for a flu vaccine annually. So even at 80%, if the vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine is at 80%, I think that's a very, very good place to start with a vaccine. That number of 90% was shocking to many in the community. If and when this vaccine is approved, have we already determined who in Connecticut will get it first? I think, you know, we have to focus on our high-risk population or most vulnerable population. And we have we have substantial data from the peak of this pandemic, who this is impacting the most, right? We also have to focus on the fact that the people who are most in harm's way, so, or healthcare providers um, or clinicians, very challenging um, uh, environments. Uh, we, we know we provide very good PPE, but if we could provide another tool, another way for them to have some level of protection, um, you know, these are groups we have to focus on. So I think at this point in time, your high vulnerable population, such as advanced age and, and um, individuals with, with comorbid conditions, and also your clinicians and healthcare providers, I think should be primary focus right now. Another part of what you're working on is the distribution. How do you see that going? Is it a drive through clinic? Does it happen at local hospitals? How do we do it? Um, so the distribution piece of it, I believe, is going to be, needs to, has to be multimodal. Um, you know, if you look at the flu vaccine, you know, we've if, every year there's multiple ways or multiple avenues by which you could get the flu vaccine. When we started looking at this, we appreciated the fact that we have a very good platform. And that platform is every single year we have the exact same discussion about vaccines, right? It's the influenza vaccine. So, you know, the plan as it stands right now, especially at Hartford, Hartford Healthcare, is to uh, utilize the existing resources as much as possible. Where the distribution is concerned, generally, through this advisory group, um, where, you know, obviously there's still a lot of discussions to be had. Um, and the the information that just came out last week will definitely help th these discussions. But distribution in general, I assume, is, is going to be focused on a multimodal approach as we should use with distributing flu vaccine. It's supposed to be a two-part vaccine, though, right? How do you track the people who've gotten the first round and then they have to come back three weeks later for their second shot? Is that making things more difficult? It is making things more difficult. But, you know, a few months ago, we were discussing how do you tell everyone to wear a mask, right? Um, I believe people who...
come forward to take the vaccine, believe in the science of it, believe in this being a primary tool, appreciating the effort that's been put forward, not just to procure the vaccine, to develop and procure the vaccine, but make it available for our citizens. Um, and I think tracking is not, it will be difficult, but I don't believe it will be potentially as difficult as looking at it just in pure logistics. One of the considerations for the Pfizer COVID drug is it needs to be kept at a tremendously cold temperature where it needs to be stored. Are Connecticut hospitals equipped for that kind of storage? Uh, I can say for Hartford Healthcare, we have one, we have two um, refrigerators at this point, or free, I guess you could say freezers, right? Um, or should say freezers, negative uh, 80 degrees with the capability of one single one having capacity of over 250,000 dosage. So we do have, if we need to expand, it's something that we, you know, we could potentially look into. But at this point, um, we do have, we do have the cap capacity to, to house a significant amount of vaccines. Let's look down the future. Last question here. What happens, and we know there are other things that are in development right now from Johnson & Johnson and Moderna. What happens when two vaccines are approved? How do you juggle that? Uh, what happened is excitement, right? <laughs> uh, that's primarily it. So the more companies that get um, trials through and, you know, we have more products to help with this process of preventing the COVID-19 um, virus or SARS-CoV-2 virus. And, uh, the, you know, the, from a science perspective, from a medical perspective, you know, we generally, the, what you're going to get is a grateful community, right? What will happen from a logistic pr perspective is, we realize that you might have different, for example, means, you might need to have different means of storing and distributing these vaccines. If, for example, one vaccine has, as we stated before, is to be distributed and administered in two dosage and one is a single dose, then you might have, you know, some complexity. But in general, this is, this is, these are um, things that we've known for weeks to months now. And, you know, we've implemented strategies in place to ensure that we're mitigating these as, as quickly as they come up. It would be a good problem to have. Keith Grant from Hartford HealthCare, thanks for joining us on Face the Facts. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.